when it comes up. And I'm also going to hit record on this end as well. Yep. Yep. It came up right away. So we are all good. All right. Let me just make sure we have everyone we need. Um, Uh, do, you, do you want to let Marissa and Joe in? You want me to do that? Uh, okay, let me just verify. Let me the button. Okay, um, I just a quick check. If you want to. I'm just trying to see if we have all board members on. And as soon as I verify that, we will get going. Um, Alec, we're all here. Okay, great. Then uh, we will get going. Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, August 18th meeting of the Edgemont Board of Education. Um, do I have a motion to bring us out of executive session into public session? Uh, Judy, uh, do I have a second? Um, uh, Monica, um, all in favor? We we are in public session at 8.07. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, let's see, first item on the agenda is the uh, approval of the July 21st, 2020 uh, minutes. Do I have a motion to approve, Marquita? Do I have a second, Judy? All in favor? Uh, people getting to work these buttons down differently. Um, okay, if people can use the uh, the yes button, <laughs> it's down there at the bottom under. Um, For the yes button, you have to open the participant list, and it's on the bottom of the participant list. Oh. Right, sorry, guys. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay. Um, okay, we are um, we are approved. Um, next um, up is the uh, approval of the minutes for the uh, August sixth meeting, which was our work session on the reopening plan. Do I have a Motion to approve, Marquita, second, Judy, all in favor? Um, we, are, we are approved. Uh, two more of these. Uh, now we move on to treasurer's reports. Uh, first is the approval of the treasurer's report for June 2020. Uh, do we have a motion to approve, Marquita, second, Judy, um, all in favor? Okay, we are approved. And um, last one of these is the approval of the treasurer's report for July of 2020. Uh, motion to approve, Pamela, second, Monica, all in favor? Um, okay, we are approved. Thank you all. Um, there is no specific recognition of community tonight, but we will be, after the presentation, we will be taking questions. We ask that you use the uh, link that was in the, the, uh, the document that had all the information about tonight's meeting to put your questions in. Some people have already. Um, if you have not um, entered your question yet, we ask that you go in there and uh, enter them there. We will try to get 
to all of them tonight. If for some reason we can't, we will either uh, follow up with you uh, individually if you've left your contact information. Um, we also uh, may address it in the FAQ, and I know that's something that uh, Victoria will be talking about um, a little bit later. Um, we have no acceptance of gifts tonight. Um, so uh, we now move on to the uh, updates on the reopening plan. So I'll turn it over to you, Victoria. Thank you, Alec, and good evening, everyone. It's hard to believe, but in just a few weeks, the 2021 school year will begin. Without a doubt, it poses an enormous challenge for all of us. And despite our best efforts, I know uncertainty persists for so many people. Yet even in this relentless pandemic, I believe that like all others, this new school year holds promise, potential, and even excitement for the Edgemont community. Classrooms will look different, and thanks for all the postings on Facebook showing photos of our classrooms, and lessons will too. Friends and teachers, old and new, will welcome one another with smiles, but under masks and through screens. Some students won't be inside the physical classroom at all. Yet, even as safety precautions create physical distance, I have never seen this community more strongly united in our joint goals than we are right now. Students and parents are attending forums by the hundreds to learn about health and safety and our hybrid and remote plans. There were seven forums just this week. The delay of the start to our school year for students on September 14th offers more opportunities for teachers who are attending professional development on new instructional models and on health and safety protocols. Counselors and school psychologists are attending trainings and providing plans to meet the emotional needs of parents, students, and staff, and all of us as we make our way through all of this newness in terms of preparation for the new year. We all want the same things. We want our community to be safe. We want all of our children to learn and thrive academically, socially, and emotionally. We want our teachers to know how appreciated and essential they are in our children's lives. This is a learning curve for all of us and we will learn and thrive together. In addition to working together for the safest possible reopening of schools, we know that some parents will choose fully remote. And we know we are looking and hoping for them to be able to advise us on their best decision this coming Friday. Of course, we will review individual situations on a case by case basis, whether moving from in person to remote or moving from remote to in person. We've also worked to improve our communications along the way and to communicate decisions as quickly and as transparently as possible. We've tried to anticipate the issues. We've looked at guidance from other states, from other countries to anticipate and to be ahead. And with that, I just want to, uh, speaking of communication, I wanna share uh, our, our newest addition on our reopening website. And that is our FAQs. If you go to the reopening website, which you can find under news, uh, are you able to see that FAQ page? Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Um, so uh, on our district website, you scroll down to news and then you can link to the reopening website. You can see all the, um, elementary school reopening plan, FAQ specific to elementary school, specific to the high school. And um, also there are some FAQs from the county that you can review as well. So please do visit our website. We do update it continually. Um, also, uh, are the questions continue to come. I'm, I'm sure that um, this evening um, we, we may hear new questions, that there may be some repeat of questions, but, but please do, do visit the FAQ and share more questions with us. As I said, this is new territory for every single member of our school community, students and adults alike. Of course, we need and want your feedback. 
but we also need your understanding, your patience and your positivity as we minimize risk for the maximum gain, that of our students' growth and development as learners in a changing world. And with that, I am going to uh, turn it over to Alec um, to start some of the questions. Okay, so um, let me just make sure I've got these so that I can uh, read them here. Oh, you know, if there are any clarifying questions from the board first oh, right. on, on any of All those right. topics. Yeah, does anyone on the board want to ask anything at this stage? Um, uh, okay, um, so I'll start with the questions. Um, first one, um, actually these first few are all related to uh, really to music. So are parents aware that under the current proposed elementary schedule, all special content areas, music, art, PE, library, band and orchestra will be 100% remote, whether the student is in school or not? So actually that's not true. They're not 100% remote. They, are, they haven't been completely scheduled yet, but it will be a rotation of art, music, physical education and library um, for in-person students and, and also remote. Obviously for the students who are choosing fully remote, the specials will be fully remote. The biggest difference from the spring is that the, re, um, that the special classes will be smaller. They won't be the large classes that they were in the spring. They will be uh, more aligned with the A cohort and the B cohort. And I invite any of the elementary administrators to, to add any more if I miss something. Uh, do any of the elementary want to stop in? Okay. Um, next question related, why must string orchestra students sit 12 feet apart to rehearse? String students are able to wear masks while playing, do not do, need to breathe any heavier while playing, do not use their breath to play. Um, Right. Actually, the uh, New York State music um, educators have put out a, an amazing document that we will be following, and I do not believe it has um, string students 12 feet apart. Okay. So I would have to go back to that document. I, I don't know if, um, if, if any of the administrators would want to respond to that, but, but strings do not need the 12 feet. Okay. And, and did you want to add? Yeah, the guidance in that document from the New York State Music Association is six feet for strings. Okay, so in terms of distancing, we can put however many people in the room that will fit based on that distancing. Correct. Okay. Great. Um, next one says, some classes at EHS do not meet every day of the cycle. Because of this, pending which cohort the student is placed in, some students of some classes will never meet in person. For example, classes that meet on day two and three during fifth period, the A cohort would never have class on campus. There are several of these scenarios on the current proposed schedule. Is this something that the community is aware of? I guess the first question is, is that accurate? I, I don't know the answer to that. Kyle, do you wanna take that? So it is true that under the first iteration of the schedule, that by dropping from nine periods a day to six, that some periods wouldn't meet every day of the cycle like they would traditionally. All of those classes where we've had issues, uh, our um, assistant principals, Ms. Joseph and Ms. Johnson, have addressed all of those. So those are no longer issues under the most recent uh, schedule that was created. Okay, great. So, so yes, you're saying by the base scheduling that would have happened, but people looked at that and shifted things around to make sure that isn't the case. That's correct. Okay, great. Thank you, Kyle. Um, what supports are in place to support teachers and staff who are new to the district? Have they been offered professional development opportunities, classes, workshops, et cetera, as current teachers? 
So uh, professional development is uh, available to all teachers. Um, it, we have a, a, a number of teachers who have uh, were hired with training already in place for them, as well as some teachers who are taking um, an STI course. Again, there is an orientation day for new teachers, as well as those four superintendent conference days that are um, front loaded uh, for all teachers, not just new teachers this year. Thank you. Uh, next, given the changing landscape for in school versus remote, is it realistic to have a fall sports program modified or other? So I, I know that we are still waiting for guidance specifically on sports and that the, the sports were being classified as um, low risk to high risk. And um, I, I do not have all the details of the sports program to discuss at this time, but I do know that Anthony DeRosa will be sending out information to parents as um, he is updated. Uh, next up, can students at EHS who choose hybrid switch to fully remote at any time? Um, so the, the switching to fully remote is a little easier to manage and, than the remote switching to in-person because of course with the in-person we're trying to manage the number of students in a classroom and trying to manage the physical distancing. But of course we will work with parents um, and individual cases on any switches that are necessary. Um, I'm just trying to look through this next one. It's fairly long. Um, so bear with me. Um, it says the forum yesterday for elementary school e-learning still did not provide much information about specifics of how hybrid students and 100% remote students would learn together slash simultaneously during the time the hybrid cohort is in the classroom, except that there will be no live streaming. The FAQ says our goal is for students who are remote to remain connected to the classroom learning, which can happen in ways other than via live streaming, for example, via the use of Google Classroom and Google Meets. Trying to accommodate both remote students and students in class is challenging, and I understand that teachers have not done this before, but I'm concerned that the physical classroom experience is also going to involve being on laptops most of the time instead of a live classroom experience, which is the reason many of us want our children to attend in, purpose, in person. Can you elaborate more in detail exactly how this work? Um, I'll sort of break it there. So, um, so, so, so we know that um, there are some people who still don't believe they have a good uh, vision of what that can look like. In fact, um, we're talking about maybe making a couple of videos, kind of what, what would it look like from a student perspective, actually walking through the schedule from a student perspective. And we will definitely work on communicating that but it is our plan to have it be a mixture so that it's um, that we're maximizing what's happening with the students in person, um, certainly differently at the elementary school than at the junior senior high school, and that we're trying to have it be a blend, not just all online, um, but a blend of all of the kinds of things that would be helpful in person. We've been talking about manipulatives. We've been talking about three-dimensional um, work in art to be able to do that when they're actually in person. So we have been talking about maximizing the live experience, but it is new and different for everyone. That's, that's why um, the patience, the positivity as we try this, because we're, we're trying to build community. And how do we build community for the children who are completely remote um, and who are here uh, partly. So um, that, that's, that has been a big challenge, but we believe that our work in hybrid learning, the work that our teachers are doing together, the work that they're doing to maximize that schedule for the grade level um, have moved us in a positive direction. Yeah, thank you. And I, I don't know if uh, any administrator would wanna add some specificity to that. I'd be happy to if that would help a little bit. You know, some of the feedback I got after I had a parent show up at Sealy Place and say, I just want to confirm, 
if you're a K to four student, does your does the morning curriculum look the same as the afternoon curriculum? And I think that this is one area that I can start in if that's okay. So we did decide to focus on our core subjects, math, ELA, as well as having that opportunity for ma uh, mask movement and snack break. We also are focusing on writing and um, in the morning section, but that same schedule will be in the afternoon section. So I'm, I'm doing it like this. And the way that we're trying to describe what that 100% remote will look like is if you consider that it's the color purple, it's the two colors that blend what it would look like in the day if you were learning ELA math and writing in school, you will be able to be connected to that learning in school. And in the afternoon, for example, if you were home as a student, you would have that social studies, which is connected to the writing and science, which is connected to the math. And we'll have those check-ins with teachers. We're going to utilize the staff that we have in our building, the teacher aides, the teachers, the teaching assistants. None of us have done this fully remote before, but we have the confidence in our staff and our faculty, our students and our parents as partners to make this work. So I think we will get through, but of course we're gonna have a lot of questions because it's something we've never experienced before, but I have really full confidence in our students and our faculty and staff. So I hope that clears it up a little bit. Think of it as the purple. <laughs> um, so if, Victoria, if you answer this, because I was trying to sort of synthesize, like I said, this is a very long question, trying to synthesize um, the rest of it there. So if you said this, I apologize. What, what seems to be the primary concern of this person is not what the remote experience looks like, but for the student that is in the thing, are in order to bring in the remote, are they going to have to be sitting there on the screen, which is supposed to detracting from sort of the advantages of, no, I'm concentrating, I'm looking at my teacher, I'm dealing directly with them as opposed to I'm looking at a screen, even though I'm in the classroom because we're trying to bring in the remote people. So they might be looking at a large screen. They might be looking at the Promethean board. Um, it's possible that at some point, if they're meeting with a small group of students, they might be having a Google meet with some of their, their friends and classmates who are home. So uh, I, I, I think that there's, there's a benefit to Google meets for children because um, that there are times that I, I've heard from parents, well, what, what if my child doesn't get to be with any children in the B cohort, right? So, right. so, so it, it will be a mixture. It won't be yeah. all on screen in class, but there might be some either large screen time or Google Meet time. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 again, I'm, I'm just having to read into this, but I, yeah. I, I got the impression the concern was more that it was might be mostly on screen when you're physically, not that there that, would be some on screen. That's not our plan. Okay. Right. to be mostly on screen though. Yep. Um, next question, please provide more information about why K2 was chosen for full day instruction after a two week trial period above other grades. It seems that this age group is the least fit to comply with mask and social distance rules. Where will these children receive their instruction? If we have extra resources available, perhaps full day instruction could be offered to other grades as well. Maybe K2 has full day instruction for a certain period of time, and then a different set of grades has the same opportunity. Our sixth graders make a huge jump when they move to the junior year. Additional time in school would definitely improve their preparation during this most important year. So, so we've had conversations about uh, all different grade levels and the needs of grade levels, and the feedback that we received had to do with um, which students were most successful at remote learning. And we heard from the parents of K1 and 2 that those students did struggle with remote learning. And it also um, was the most difficult for parents. I, I think the, the students struggled and, and the parents struggled as well because the parents had to be full time with those students. So uh, we certainly, depending upon the numbers, depending upon our space, can, can review K-1-2. A, a, a big part of it is certainly, can they follow the safety protocols, but also how are they doing? What are our assessments telling us? That's going to be a big driver for us. How, how are the students doing? 
who, who is thriving in person, who is thriving remotely, who, who needs help. So that's going to be a big part of our September is, is getting a sense of how the children are doing. And what we do know about COVID is we must be flexible and we will continue to be flexible. Um, how will fifth graders be receiving Chromebooks? Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Paul Garifano if you uh, could answer that, please. Sure thing. Um, unfortunately, um, our large order of Chromebooks, like every other district uh, in this part of the country or the country entirely this year, um, because of increased demand and a delay in supply and manufacturing, um, our big order was delayed until December, January of 2021. So we have reallocated or in the process of reallocating all of the Chromebooks from the high school, which were shared devices, which for health and safety reasons, um, they wouldn't be shared devices anyway. And we're reallocating them to most of them to our fifth graders and then trying to spread the rest out among the other grades that need them. And if and when the Chrome, the fifth grade order comes in of the new Chromebooks, um, we will uh, uh, coordinate with the fifth graders to take back the Chromebooks that we issue them the first week of school and give them their new devices and take the existing Chromebooks and put them back into circulation for uh, the general population of students and staff. Um, I think that answer is sort of like, where are you getting your supply from? But I, I got the impression this question is more about the logistics of physically getting those Chromebooks to the fifth graders. Oh, no, nothing has changed with that. Every year, um, my staff and I organize the Chromebooks in each of the fifth grade classrooms um, with asset tags assigned to each student and the teachers uh, hand those Chromebooks out to the students the usually the first couple of days of school depending upon the, the teacher. So if um, with the students who choose to be fully remote, um, just like the technology department had a way for um, students and parents to pick up devices, I'm, I'm sure we will use a similar process to have them uh, picked up for the remote only students. Um, okay, next question. Uh, I'll read it again, but the first half I think has is, is basically been answered before, but uh, second half, maybe not. It says, if a high school student opts for in-person learning and they opt into remote learning at any time if they feel uncomfortable, circumstances change. So I think we basically answered that one. Right. The second half says, can a parent request a particular half day session that works best with their schedule? Um, they, they can request it. They can contact the principal. And I know the principals are doing their best to try to honor requests, but, but it will come down to um, the, the numbers and the physical distancing. Um, next question. Uh, I've heard that a group of Scarsdale parents who are doctors are raising concerns that the chemicals used to clean the classes between the AM and PM sessions are not healthy for children coming to the PM to be breathing in and have asked the board to consider the two to three full day sessions for children instead. Can you please let us know if you've heard about these concerns and have medical professionals weighed in on whether can ch children can be in an enclosed classroom shortly after the chemicals are used. I presume that's a John McCabe. Sure, so yeah, I'd like to ask John McCabe to answer that question, please. Good evening. Uh, we're gonna be using a chemical called hypochlorous acid, which is essentially pool water. Uh, we'll be generating it on site in the two elementary schools. Of all the disinfectants I've seen out there, this is probably the most green product I've come across. And it was a, a pretty critical part of our decision to go with this product in the interim uh, change of classes for disinfecting. So that'll be part of our three-pronged approach. Um, it really, it doesn't have any real health concerns. You can, you can pretty much even drink it without becoming ill from it. So um, I don't have any concerns with it being sprayed in the classrooms and the, the students coming in, you know, a half hour after it's been done. Uh, it should be pretty well settled by then, and we're not 
putting so much of it into the air that it's going to hang for a long time. It's really just with the electrostatic sprayers, it's a very efficient process, a very thin coating in and out of a room in about a minute and a half. And the residual uh, remaining uh, substance on the surfaces will dissipate very quickly. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the next question is, please explain full remote model in more details, how teachers and students will interact, how will classes be held, how will lab work, will there be interaction between students at home and while having a class in person, how will extra help work, will grades be different than kids in person than online, if they have group project, how it, will it work when learning online? That's, there's a lot of different questions in there. I don't, I'll let you choose how you want to do. I know some of those our sessions have gone into detail on those and that there are videos posted on the website that probably answer most of those in a lot more detail than we can answer in this, but Victoria, I'll let you yeah, so, have it, what so, piece do you want. So, so, so that's what I'm wondering because we have uh, pushed out videos about that. We have pushed out um, explanations. We had the uh, parent forums this week, the seven parent forums and student parent forums um, to um, get at that with some specificity. However, obviously I, I know there are still some questions. So I guess I'm wondering if, it, if any of the um, Administrators, high, um, Alec, is that more of a high, more of a high school? I'm, I'm guessing with um, about grades and labs, grades and labs. I presume so. It does not. The person did not identify sort of what their connection was. Um, so I, I guess would any administrator like to try to take a crack at um, one piece of that question, maybe from a different angle, um, maybe to describe it. In a, in a different way than we've pushed out there or add to it. Victoria, is it helpful if I speak about labs and grades a little bit? That would be great. Thanks, Kyle. So in, in terms of labs, we do expect to have science labs both on campus and virtual labs. The, uh, the number of virtual labs that we can access, there are some really great resources. And I know I was in a meeting with Ms. Bayless and she was talking about some of the great resources that she's uh, found. But we do expect to have labs both on campus and virtual. And in, in terms of grades, uh, last year we did have a, the third quarter, which was pass fail. We do not expect to have pass fail grades for any of the quarters. We expect grading to be very similar to what it was prior to the pandemic. Okay. Um, wow. Anyone else want to add to any part of that angle? I think the part about a group project is very interesting on here. I think that what we have learned in remote learning is that group projects are possible even when apart. So apart, this is where remote but connected comes in. We may not be physically together, but we can certainly get a lot of projects done, a lot of learning done, and a lot of collaboration done, even if we're not in the same room. I see that as the last part of this um, question. And I've been really proud of the work our students have done, um, whether it was a STEAM project in fourth grade or a writing project in second grade. Our students can work on these group projects even when they're not physically together. Well, I guess maybe the one other, because I think this is a short answer, and I did it, um, extra help. Um, so for extra help for the junior, senior high school, just yeah. like, um, you're thinking it could be both in-person or virtual. The benefit of in-person, of course, is the more teachers and students can interact in person, we, you know, you can read students a little bit more and, and figure out how best to support them. The problem with it being uh, only in person is it limits the number of students who could participate with extra help. We know that teachers will have two extra help sessions every week. So there is a benefit to have an extra help be virtual. So as many students who want to participate can, and we're working on finalizing those details in the next week or two. Great, thank you. Um, next question, why don't we start with online only first for everyone to see how it will be when everyone, all jobs, colleges, mostly doing it now, why are no one, and I'm sorry, this is 
Jerry, G-E-R-R-I, for tested before starting. So I'm not sure if anyone else can interpret what that question means. I think it's getting tested before starting. Probably, that's probably the best guess. Um, so, um, so there is no requirement for students to be COVID tested nor for adults to be COVID tested um, be before coming to work, how however, or coming to school. However, um, we will be using a screening app for health screening daily, for uh, taking temperatures daily, and also all adults will be trained in um, uh, observing students and, and each other for, um, for illness. The nurses as well have been going through training and will be our key partners. Uh, we are fortunate to have two nurses at the junior senior high school and one um, and a full-time nurse in each elementary school with a, an additional part-time nurse who, who moves throughout the district. Um, it, it, as far as starting remote, we are continually looking at and, and interacting with the county in terms of the uh, infection rate, uh, which is, as you know, below 1%. At this time, we're also talking a lot about staggering. What, what, what does it look like to start? We already pushed back our start so that uh, teachers can have additional time. We can start by first having teachers learning and practicing all the safety protocols, continuing in preparation for hybrid and remote learning. Um, and, and We'll look at what, what the whole orientation, I, I know that the administrators and the teachers and the committees they've been working with have been talking about what does it look like to build community? What does it look like to bring the students back? And I'm sure they'll have lots of um, innovative ways to do that in an appropriate staggered way that's honoring what, what it really means for everyone to, to come back and, and how to do that safely. Can I add something? Sure, please. please. Yeah, hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Mr. Curtin. Um, just, uh, you know, the, the premise of universities um, not bringing students back, I think, and also work, but primarily universities, a lot depends on the region of the country you're in. To my knowledge, um, New York universities, uh, and specifically New York University, um, Columbia, I think Fordham, um, they are having students back on, to, on college, uh, on campus. Um, and I think a lot depends on the region of the country you're in. New York State, fortunately, at this point, has one of the very lowest infection rates and so and has parameters for uh, thresholds once we reach a certain level where um, we then would have to go remote because, uh, we're, but we're nowhere near that level. So that's good news. And I think too that, um, that um, college campuses are oftentimes residential, which is a whole other ball of wax. Um, and so it's a little bit um, different for a K-12 situation in New York than compared to like a massive, you know, 30,000 student university in, um, you know, the, the Southeast. So just, a, just another way to kind of contextualize it. Anyone else want to say anything else on that one? Um, so this next one has to do with the uh, open letter that was posted um, on the um, Lakewood site. It says, are the administration and the Edgemont Teachers Union aligned on the hybrid reopening plan as the letter recently signed and distributed by 50 or more Hudson Valley Teachers Unions stating their discomfort with returning to school leaves me with the impression that there's not alignment with which, which will most likely result in a remote plan for all. Um, I don't know, Victoria, if you want to talk to that. I don't know if you want to go into some of the specifics that were in that so, letter or not. Yeah, so, so I can certainly talk about in terms of um, continual conversation and continual meetings and agreements regarding schedules. Um, certainly, uh, everyone still continues to have um, health and safety concerns and a number of those have been addressed. In, in fact, we have um, Dr. Walid Javid, 
um, on with us this evening so that we could dig into some of the health and safety questions that have been raised um, at recent meetings with uh, stakeholder groups. We have a health and safety committee in each school building. Um, and uh, Dr. Javid is the hospital epidemiologist and director of infection prevention and control in Mount Sinai, uh, at, uh, the downtown network in Mount Sinai, uh, Brooklyn. Um, so uh, we, we can go through a, a, a couple specific questions that still remain, but I, I know that we have been addressing them. Each principal held a health and safety uh, specifically, uh, or either held or is about to hold a specific health and safety meeting, but if someone would like to ask additional health and safety questions, if there are unanswered questions, this would be a good time certainly to ask them. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I would just say that, right, we, we've gone through, I mean, first of all, this is, it's, it wasn't something that was actually brought to us. As you see, it was a letter to the community. It was not specific concerns brought by our teachers union to us, although our teachers union did sign on to it. But we have gone through the specific actual actual actionable items that were in there and have, um, we believe, answered, answered them either in terms of, um, like one of them is COVID testing, as Dr. Newell has um, answered that it's not a requirement. It is not something we are looking to do at this time. It's something that actually we're not we're not allowed to do. We aren't allowed to have require our students or teachers to be tested. So, but um, right, if somebody wants to come back with a specific question out of there that they have concerns, then by all means, please put it in the. Um, the spreadsheet. Uh, next question, when will the final grouping slash cohorts and schedules be released? That might be slightly different by level. So I'll, I'll ask the principals if they could please uh, respond. Hi everyone. Um, for the elementary schools, our class lists are really ready to go at this point. What we're waiting on is the full information for remote learning. Um, we need to see where our numbers are at to see if we need to reorganize any classes or structures based on remote learning. We've also had a lot of new students moving into the district, which is absolutely wonderful, but we're trying to get them all into classes as well. So we are hoping, and I believe I speak for all three buildings, to have our first, the elementary schools to have our class assignments out by next week and all three schools to have our cohorts done by next week as well. So I really speak on behalf of the administration to say thank you for your patience. I know what it's like waiting for that teacher assignment to come home and your students, even in our student forum today, they wanna know who their teachers are. So we truly do understand and we are working as fast as we can to get that information to you. At the junior senior high school, we've said that we were optimistically hoping to send out cohorts by the end of the week. In terms of students' schedules, those would not be released until the week before classes begin, but we know families need to know whether their um, children are in the AM or PM cohorts as soon as possible. Thank you. Um, uh, this next question, so I'm going to read it, but I think it, it's a little too broad to do. It said, I would like this board to discuss concerns raised by the Scarsdale teachers on the last Scarsdale Board of Education meeting as reported by the Scarsdale Inquirer. And they've just put a link into, uh, into the article. Um, I, I think I'm gonna have to say that's a little too broad. If, if you have specific questions you want to bring to us, um, that's fine. But just to throw an article at us, and say, you know, please respond. I, I, I'm afraid we don't have the time to do that at, at this point, um, uh, unless someone wants to comment on that from the administration. Um, and again, those were concerns raised by Scarsdale teachers, not Edgemont 
teachers. So every district is different. The concerns by their teachers are different. Their situations are different. Their plans are different. So um, for, for example, just as, as evidenced by one of the earlier questions, they were talking about concerned Scarsdale parents with the cleaning and the time between. But Scarsdale's using different cleaning processes and chemicals than we are. So, you know, not really an apples to apples comparison. Um, next question. Can you discuss Dr. Newell's email from August 9th, specifically the K2 plan? I've heard conflicting reports and it is important to be transparent with the plan. Is is the below, which I'll read in a second, still expected? We believe this is great, but most important is transparent, transparency and details on how this will work. And what they've quoted, it says, within the first two weeks of school, we will carefully review our reopening and acclimation to the new safety protocols, hybrid and e-learning practices. If all is going well, we expect to provide a full in-person schedule for K-2 students, 8.30 to 3 p.m. So um, let me back up with, with a little bit of um, when we first received the charge from the state of New York, which was to bring as many students as possible back into the schools, but to do so safely. So we started actually with an architectural review of all of our space to see what would it look like and how many students could we bring back safely. Well, what we saw is that uh, to bringing back most of our students wouldn't be what we were interested in educationally if we just had desks everywhere and, and that were six feet apart and children were masked. That, that's not the kind of education um, we were interested in. In Edgemont, we wanted to make the best of our time with students, but we also, if we had the space and we were able to bring in the students who most benefit from in-person, which in our minds was the, the youngest children because the, they were not um, benefiting from the feedback we received. They were not benefiting as much from a fully remote program in the spring. So we realized that we could fit them. We had the space. It wouldn't mean that all 20 students were in the same classroom with their classroom teacher. It would mean that the students would be physically distanced. So it'd be half, half of the students in one classroom, half of the students in another classroom, and the teacher would be the one to go back and forth to those two halves. Uh, we would also maximize the use of our um, teacher aides, we would have um, the special, special area teachers, um, music, art, phys ed, and library also, because if the students were in full day, that would mean they, they would not have specials remote. They would actually have specials in person, just like they would have their normal school day. However, they would just be in two smaller cohorts. Yes, we do still plan to evaluate. We plan to evaluate a number of things as we reopen and, and that will um, we, we will review first in terms of health and safety. And as I said earlier, we'll review our assessments and see how our students are doing. Thank you. Next question says, when there are tests with half the students virtual and half in class, do they all take the same test at the same time? So we've been doing a lot of work on um, what is the role of a paper pencil test? What is the role of um, what we refer to as high stakes test? Tests that, um, re um, that measure um, the, the type of learning students have done or, 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 or what are they able to either apply or remember? So we're looking at varying our types of assessments um, so that it, it because it, it does look different. It's different hybrid and it's, it's different online. And I know that those conversations have been happening at forums and I don't know if um, either Mike Curtin or, or Kyle, if you wanna jump in on the assessment topic. Um, Victoria, one thing I would add is just for everyone to know that many of our teachers, when they teach multiple courses, rather than give the same test to a second period class and a seventh period class, they normally do create two or three different versions 
just to make sure that uh, there's no pressure put on students from second period to say what's on the test for students who are in the seventh period class. So we expect uh, teachers to work with students to build similar skills, to provide similar experiences and to uh, cover similar content um, on campus and at home. And so one way to make sure that we assess uh, consistently is to use similar assessments, whether students are on campus or at home. Anyone else? So the crickets are coming from my my window. I'm actually happy to have um, Edgemont crickets. It's a nice <laughs> summer summer evening. <laughs> um, I I think this was basically answered. Says when when will we be notified if we are in the A or B cohort? Thanks. So I think that was basically what end of next week for the high school and. Um, the same. We're all aligned. And part of it is going to be trying to, you know, work with families on some of the requests that have come in is specifically the PHS and elementary, but we are all aiming for the end of next week. Right. And the next one, I think, is just a variation on the same question before. When will we know if the full day option will happen for those who have opted for that? And so presumably that's sometime after the two weeks and assessing how things are going. So, I mean, in terms of rough timing. Uh, assuming that they're referring to the K-2 yeah. full day option. We, yeah, we haven't um, talked about or, or been able to fit in any other full day option at this point. Right. But they were just talking about the timing in terms of yeah. when they would right. know, so. Correct. Right. Can you provide more information on contact tracing process? I'm curious about the accuracy and complexities managing the process with students. Um, so the district will not be conducting contact tracing. However, we will be partnering with the Department of Health because we will be providing information for contact tracing. And uh, we will count on that information uh, from the Department of Health. Okay. Uh, next one is half comment, half question. It says, uh, first, thank you for your consistently and significantly advancing the level and depth of planning that has been with the community. As parents, we've gone from skeptical to impressed and recognize the hard work and really appreciate it. Uh, the question is, for elementary, will classes be live streamed for full remote students and will students have an opportunity to ask questions during class time? So um, students will have an opportunity to, to be connected. I, I, I wouldn't say that it's going to be live streamed, meaning a camera in the room at all times. However, there will be opportunities for students to be together, possibly for a morning meeting, possibly to frame um, a teaching point or a mini lesson, and then the students um, will, will be off in, in different groups, whether um, in, in classroom or um, on, on a Google Meet. Um, but I, I, I don't know if um, any of my colleagues, I don't know if, if, if Marisa, if you wanted to, uh, to take a stab at that one. My audio broke up a bit. Could you just restate the sure. question? Sure. Sorry. Um, will, will classes be live streamed for fully remote students? And will students have an opportunity to ask questions during class time? Sure. So um, we're thinking about we're thinking about the plan in terms of sort of a continuum. On one side would be that full live streaming, and on the other side would be um, just having contact with a teacher when you're when you're in school and you know, sort of being left to your own devices when you're at home, finishing um, a bunch of work. So the contact that students could potentially have with their teachers when they're home would be through small group opportunities for Google Meets, where a teacher may pull two students in the classroom to work with them in front of them and the students would be, the students at home would also join a Google Meet and they would all work together, which would really be nice for the students to, to have time with the, the 
with those in the classroom. Um, other options are to have sort of a buddy at home. So an in-school buddy could have a home buddy. And that would, also, that would allow for a turn and talk opportunities. That would allow for students to collaborate on projects together. Um, other opportunities for students to meet with teachers could be via Padlet or Flipgrid, which are platforms that we use successfully in the spring. Um, in addition, we're hoping that students would have a live document for them to write questions on. So if a teacher was working with students in their classroom, the teacher could also go over to that live Google Doc and answer questions for students at home. So those are some of the opportunities, but we're hoping that you know those will grow as time goes on and teachers become more comfortable with the technology. Okay. Anyone else? I would just add, oh. You go ahead. Yeah, I just add that I think of it is the, the phrase we keep using is remote but connected and important parts of that are um, structure, making sure that there's a schedule for remote learners while they're home of some sort, Le expectations that happen periodically through the day. Uh, so there's some level of accountability during the day for the student. And then also, as Marisa uh, alluded to, communication. So kids are not just cut loose at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day, depending on which cohort you're in, but rather they have some connection to uh, ask questions of the teacher, to see some of what's going on in the classroom. But as, um, as some have noted, we don't want kids staring at screens all day. And so it's trying to encourage a more sort of active kind of learning um, for, for our kids. Um, so I hope that, that it's a difficult thing to understand and what it looks like on September 14th and what it looks like on November 14th will probably be different as kids, as teachers get used to this new way of doing things. And so uh, we're excited about the different possibilities. Ms. Ferrara just mentioned a couple, but there are many other ways that, that we're looking to grow in our understanding and our implementation of that, that concept of remote but connected. You. Anyone else want to say anything before we move on to the next question? All right. Um, the next one is there are actually four questions, so I'll take them one at a time. Uh, first was what was the criteria for selecting stakeholders for a reopening plan decision? So um, there were a number of different stakeholder groups. There was uh, one very large stakeholder group, which we used to kind of bounce ideas off of, and, and that group included police department, fire department, uh, the BOCI safety director, um, included a number of parents with, uh, with medical backgrounds, included um, some parents uh, with different backgrounds like architecture, uh, parents who were responsible for reopening um, different firms and, and corporate offices. Um, administrators, board members, but uh, students, so every possible stakeholder. Uh, the, the police were important. A number of people keep asking about crossing guards and, and how will they play into this. So it, it was really important to get feedback and questions from every um, stakeholder group that, that would be impacted by our plans. We also had a number of small working groups. We had an academic task force. We have building-based groups that um, we had the custodians involved, uh, the head custodians in terms of walking through and rearranging desks. So um, it was a, a combination of recommendations from our, our, um, our teachers association, our clerical association, uh, recommendations by PTA, PTSA, um, so some volunteers with expertise. Uh, so it was a, a combination of methods. Uh, next question says, what is the rationale for using the current hybrid model? Considering the current plan exposes students to maximum contacts with the new plan, all students will be in the building every day. So the number of contacts is, is high and plus the period between in-person education and e-learning might not be enough. Students should come to home, wash hand, disinfect laptop, eat lunch, 
40 minutes might not be enough and overwhelming for students. So first of all, I think we don't have, certainly at the, in the AMPM don't have students eating lunch at school. So there isn't any leaving and coming back, but there's certainly other things in there about the, you know, the health implications of having um, students, everyone coming every day and. Um, so so I, I could speak to part of that and then I'll ask um, any of the other administrators to jump in, but it, it was important what we heard in, in this in the spring also is that it was important for students to kind of um, be in that those learning behaviors and be connected to school and that being connected to school every day was Im important uh, to the community as, as we received feedback and also as educators as we were talking about how to, how to best balance the needs of the students obviously with the safety. This is all about balance and it's all about um, managing risk. Uh, so it, we actually have increased the amount of time for the transitions so that um, students do have time to get home, to eat lunch and to be ready to log on and join uh, for the remote section or, or, or wh whichever flip that they're doing morning or afternoon. Uh, we, we did receive that feedback from parents early on and, and those adjustments were made. Um, in, in terms of the cleaning as well, uh, we'll be cleaning classrooms. If, if a student, if, if the students are, are not scheduled for class and that classroom is free, we will start cleaning even before the transition period. So I don't, no, if anyone else wanted to jump in on any other parts of that question. I'd love to, because we've had the good fortune of having student forums um, at the elementary schools and at EHS. And one of the best things that was said to me as a principal and as a parent was, I'm so happy that I get to come to school every day. I feel so lucky that I get to see my teachers every day. And I think that as educators, if we know one thing about children, it's that they benefit from a schedule and they benefit from consistency. And knowing that each day you either wake up and have breakfast and jump on your Google Meet or you go to school, I see that as such a gift to our children. And I'm really proud of the plan that we've created as a district because I think it meets the social emotional needs of our students. And I think it meets the learning needs of our students. And I, I think it meets the health and safety requirements that are really the top priority of this all while we're living in a pandemic. So I, for one, am so excited to be able to see the students either virtually or in person each day. So thank you. Eve, just to build on that point, uh, practically having students on campus every day, we see a benefit there. If we think about what it would look like under a nine period day, if we had followed our traditional schedule, we wouldn't have an opportunity to disinfect during the middle of the day. We would have students arrive at 830, they would leave at 302, and the disinfectant would only happen after ninth period. With this model, the AMPM model, instead we have three periods in, we have a, about 60 minutes to disinfect, and then another three classes who come in, um, students who come in for the three classes in the afternoon. The other benefit of the AM PM model is that we completely avoid the concerns related to lunch. If students were on campus for all nine periods, they would have to take off their masks, they would have to have lunch. Under this model, students who are in for the AM session eat lunch at home afterwards, and students who have the PM session eat lunch before they arrive at school. So we think if you consider all the different variables, that the AMPM model is actually the safer option for our Edgemont students. Okay, um, next question, part of this person's questions. How are students and teachers going to manage safety measures between periods, including washing hands, disinfectant sets, ventilating, ventilating rooms, is six minutes enough? So um, there will be options. There will be, um, students can use sinks to hand wash. They can also use hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer will be available for, for washing hands uh, before entering 
the next classroom, the, the rooms are continually ventilated and um, will be cleaned as mentioned previously by, by John McCabe after the, um, after the morning cohort. So, um, but, but the ventilation is always on. What is your plan for students with special education? So it, it um, depends on the specific needs of the special education students. There are some special education students who were not benefiting as much from remote learning who will be in school full time. And then there is a variety of special education services um, that will be available. And I will um, let Dr. Shippa uh, respond in a little more detail than that. Thank you. So um, as Victoria said, there we were charged with really looking at the individual needs of all of the students that had IEPs um, and determined the level of need. Uh, and therefore, some students will have full days of school uh, based upon those needs. Uh, accordingly, as you look at each student and the kinds of services that they have, um, we're going to be looking at how to deliver both the special education services, for instance, in our integrated co-taught classes when students are on site for those classes, as well as special classes, and, uh, and then the related services that go with those classes. Um, we're not completely, we haven't completely determined whether related services will take place in person for all of our special education students or remotely. Uh, but we're looking at all of those situations right now, and we'll have a better idea of that within the next uh, week or so. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question. What percentage of a remote-only student's instruction will be based upon live instruction, synchronous, versus recorded instruction, asynchronous? Will a remote student be allowed to ask questions in a live classroom? I think we've asked answered that one, but the first part in terms of sort of the mix between um, live versus asynchronous for uh, this is for fully remote students. Um, so, so it will depend certainly upon the, the grade and age of a child in terms of the percentage. And I um, don't know, uh, Mr. Curtin, if you could speak to a um, little more specifically specifics on on that question regarding yeah i i, I guess it's, it's without picking a, a grade level it's hard to answer that um the percentage mm -hmm. question but but I, I guess the point of being connected and being able to ask questions and knowing that um there is a portion of every class that they would have that opportunity um mr kirchen yeah i mean like i said it's going to very wildly, widely, um, based on a number of factors, the, the age level of the kids, the nature of the material being taught on a given day, um, the teacher's sort of growing comfort level with, with remote teaching. Um, so it's, it's really hard to say. Again, the, the guideline is remote but connected, which means that there's um, no set percentage of the day that kids are gonna be engaged in live connections with the teacher, but um, the goal is to make sure that those kids have a connection, that they're not just floundering without any guidance or support um, while they're at home learning. We really wanna make sure that they have some opportunity to connect um, while they're learning from home. I'm sorry, I can't be any more specific, but what that looks like is gonna vary depending on so many different factors. Okay. Um... Next up, are students mandated to wear masks and gloves? Uh, students will be mandated to wear masks. Yes, that will be an expectation for all students and all um, adults on campus. But they're not mandated to wear gloves. Not mandated to wear gloves, no. Um, next we have, will you further address uh, athletics. What happens if the decision is made not to play football? Does that mean all fall sports would be canceled too? So um, 
As you probably know, the fall sports were delayed uh, to start until at least September 21st. And I know that the New York State uh, um, Athletics Task Force was looking at many different scenarios for running sports this year. And they're looking to be creative. I don't think anyone wants to cancel all sports. They do want to uh, minimize risk. And I know are, are working on some creative plans to make sure athletics uh, can be a, a, a part of our students' education this year. I guess I would just say from what I've seen is right, there's certainly no linkage between any individual sports. I mean, they're looking at obviously what are the risk levels associated with different sports. So right. for example, again, I, right, none of us know where they're going to come out, but there's clearly been stated that football is a much higher risk sport than tennis is. And so you certainly could have football canceled without having all other sports being canceled if they were considered of acceptable risk. Correct. Thank you, Alec. Uh, what is the plan for after school clubs at EHS? Kyle, do you want to take that or, or um, Jennifer or Mary Rose for that matter? I'm happy to jump in unless Ms. Johnson or Ms. Joseph would like to take it. Uh, so for uh, clubs, we want to make sure that students have an opportunity to engage in clubs. Again, we may have some clubs that meet in person. We may have times where it makes more sense to meet virtually. When clubs do meet in person, we need to make sure that students are socially distanced, just like they would be during class time. The other thing that I would add is that some of our clubs participate in different tournaments and competitions with hundreds of other kids. When we, where we are now, it seems hard to, to think that we would uh, engage in all of those tournaments and competitions, but we'll have to see where we are as, uh, as a state, as a so society, as we get closer to all of those different events. But we do want to make sure students can engage with clubs at the junior, senior high school. Okay, thank you. Um, next one has some, has a comment at the beginning, and then it has some questions. And some of these questions, I think, Someone in the administration has already sort of put their answers in there, but we'll get to that when I get to that part of it. Um, first part is really a comment. I think the district has done a thorough job preparing to and explaining how surfaces are cleaned. I also appreciate the dedication and efforts put forward in considering alternative schedules. I'm having a difficult time understanding the quality of the air inside the buildings, especially Greenville. I have personally seen one child and one adult faint at Greenville with doors and windows open. When I read the responses at the bottom of the page, I'm not sure what that's referring to. I wondered if the dampers have been opened in the past. Is there any chance HEPA air, fuel, air purifiers can be used inside the classrooms in any way? So um, what we, what we stress for sure is that the ventilators, those unit ventilators have to be open and have to be clear. Um, I, I think now the ventilators will be the most important piece of equipment in a classroom. And I think everyone will, will certainly take those ventilators very seriously and make sure um, they're, they're, they're cleared. Um, I, I don't know, John, if, the, if there's anything about that uh, ventilation that you would want to add to, to, to about the quality of the air at Greenville? Uh, like you uh, alluded to, the, the most important thing about a ventilation system is to keep it running and to keep it run running as designed, really. Um, you don't want to start changing uh, how the system functions, especially with the filtration process. There's been a lot of discussion about filters on these systems and it's really best to run them as designed to uh, maintain the proper velocity and pressures through the system so that you have the proper amount of air changes within the space as, as required. Um, 
Thank you, John. I, I was wondering about the HEPA filters. I was wondering if Dr. Javid could could maybe speak to um, the, uh, the, the necessity of a HEPA filter or not. Yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, uh, and uh, I hope you guys can hear me. Yes, <laughs> yes. Can. thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, Victoria. So we we did discuss about uh, HEPA filters, but I want was I gave you an example earlier uh, that in the hospital we actually don't have HEPA filters for majority of our patients, and that's where we have the sickest of the sick. Even for certain uh, patients with COVID uh, nineteen illness, we don't have HEPA filters. It's required very in very specific uh, circumstances when certain procedures or patients are in ICU or there are certain procedures being done. Uh, so I think uh, that kind of uh, alludes to the fact that uh, the necess and we don't see outbreaks in hospitals as uh, one uh, is, uh, imagines um, would occur if our ventilation system was inadequate. Now I'm talking about buildings that might be even 100 years old. Um, I've had a lot of experience in different buildings recently in hospitals, and we we did put HEPA filters, but in areas that uh, were critically ill patients, where we were putting a lot of things in people's throat and all that, and that's not what's happening in schools. Um, and, my, and I think the flip side of it is, which John actually also mentioned, which is spot on actually, is uh, that uh, the uh, when we increase the filtration, we actually decrease the amount of air exchanges in the room, and that actually would uh, be counterproductive. Uh, the more important thing is that we're exchanging the air in the room more more quickly. So there's a lot of things uh, about that, and HEPA filter in itself is uh, is it's not a necessity, and it really doesn't add anything. And sometimes it worries me that the HEPA filters also blow air, so it might cause some detriment as well. So uh, there's more technicalities, and I can always get into details if uh, if you guys want to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to just follow up on that. I, 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 I think I can infer one thing that we haven't talked about from the way the question was worded. We're saying, I've seen one child and one adult faint. Presumably that's got to be on one of those super hot days, which is a, a different issue than, you know, air quality per se. So, um, I, so I discussed I, that some. So I, yes, I can speak to, to the heat. Um, it is very possible, as, as you know all too well, we do not have air conditioned schools and um, we will be watching the heat carefully, especially now with everyone wearing masks. Um, if, if we see that we expect classrooms will be at nearing 90 degrees or 90 degrees, um, first of all, if it's nearing that, we would want to get students out, outside and get them into shade um, and get them as, as cool as possible, as well as uh, their teachers and, and teacher aides and, and all the staff. Um, and, and we will possibly have to call a heat day. If we have a very hot September, we might have to call a fully remote day if we expect one of those very, very uh, warm days. Thank you. Um, next question is sort of general, how will classrooms be ventilated? And I see an answer below that. I don't know if someone in the administration has filled that in. Um, is that John, is that you there? That is... How are classrooms ventilated? Yeah. It, it, in the spreadsheet, somebody's actually put an answer into it. Alec, Alec, I think that's the that's from the back page. Yeah. The person that, that is the, from the back page. Uh, bottom Perfect. of the FAQ. Yeah. OK. Oh. Okay. So I think that's what they're referencing when they say at the bottom of the page. Okay. Um, so do we want to just answer that? So the, basically from the FAQ, it says dampers on the top of each building will be open, increasing ventilation. All classrooms have windows that can be opened. Ventilation will occur through the existing ventilation systems. Um, the next question was, what are the air exchange rates within our classrooms? Um, and again, this was one that's included in the FAQ. Although air exchange rates are room and building specific with dampers 100% open, a complete exchange of air in a classroom occurs in approximately six minutes on average. Um, next question says, what assurance does the staff of Evgemont have 
when parents knowingly will send their children to school with a fever only masked by Tylenol or any fever reducer? So uh, we have to count on our parents as partners. They have been our partners uh, differently than ever before in the spring and we're counting on them to, to be our partners uh, through both hybrid and fully remote. I think so, so I know the nurses are planning on completely communicating with parents and expecting that um, all students will have their temperature taken in the morning and that um, especially in the time of the pandemic that they were, will err on the side of safety and keep their students, uh, their children home if they're sick and to not mask a, a fever with Tylenol or a fever reducer. I think a, another, um, possibility this year that might help with that. Sometimes parents uh, want to send their students in no matter what because they don't want them to miss instruction. All of our students will be in an A and B cohort. So it is possible that if a student is home sick but well enough to work that they could just join their, their remote A or B cohort for that day as well. Um, one other thing that I guess maybe a comment I'd make, like to make that then maybe Dr. Uh, Javid can, can follow up and elaborate on what I'm saying is that all of the protocols we have in place are there with the assumption that we have students who have COVID-19, right? If, if, if nobody had COVID-19, there'd be no reason to have any of these precautions. The, the precautions are in place to basically say that even if someone is there with the disease, the precautions will keep that disease from spreading. And Dr. Javid, do you want to maybe elaborate on that? Is that a good assessment? Uh, it, yes, and I think you said it right uh, and spot on in terms of uh, that we, uh, even though it seems like uh, things are much better and they are, uh, we we are we haven't really seen the end of it. We still see in hospitals and across the state. We still see uh, low numbers, uh, but there are still cases that are ongoing and new cases. It's not old cases that we see repeatedly. So there is COVID. There is COVID in the community. There is COVID um, uh, elsewhere. Um, so we are in a different phase of pandemic than we were in March uh, or April when schools were closed. We, um, as a comparison, I think on August 10th, there were 500 cases in, in, uh, in entire New York state. And on April 11th, um, in the middle of pandemic, we had 11,000 cases. So there's a huge difference, but there's still 500 cases. Uh, so yes, we do have some cases. Yes, majority of our precautions are to mitigate those risks, minimize those risks. Uh, and actually we should interact with each other as if the other person may have COVID. So if you and I are talking, uh, we should interact, not shake hands, unfortunately, stay six feet apart, wear our masks, do a hand hygiene before and after, exactly for the reason what you said earlier, which is that one of us might have COVID and we need to be very, very cognizant. Um, and we really need to look at it as a community, as a work together. We, we all are in it together. Um, if, if the community has more cases, hospital has more cases, uh, physicians have more cases, um, healthcare workers have cases, it, it really it goes a whole circle, comes back to us. And it's really, if we don't look at it as, 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 as a one whole group, we will not, uh, not, ben, uh, not benefit from it. I actually wanted to answer a question which wasn't asked of me, um, but uh, I just want to address the question about testing everyone. Um, just because uh, I also alludes to this thing um, and people will ask, hey, well, if you're assuming people are positive or could be positive, why would you test? Testing is, is not the end all. Testing in itself, like if, I can test negative and might still have COVID, and we have seen that. I can test positive and might actually not have infectious virus in it, in, in me. And why, why is that? Because uh, you, 
all of us need to recognize or realize is this virus was discovered in January. All the testing that is available is not FDA approved. It is actually FDA emergency use authorization, which really is, there are good tests out there. I'm not belittling the test quality, but um, the test itself has some false positive and false negatives. So how do we eliminate that? Um, in my hospital, I don't test everybody who walks into my, my hospital's door. We can do that, but we don't do it because we have not found it necessary. We have not tested all of our staff because it's not necessary. Testing people who are symptomatic or have any reason to be tested should be tested. So somebody's getting procedures and all that, there's some certain condition. But testing everybody is doesn't give you the answers uh, with this 100% confidence. If I had a magic test that would say that if I test myself and I'll, I'm negative, that means I cannot infect anyone, then we probably need to not do anything else after that. No, no precautions or nothing, but we haven't gone there yet. There, there is some ways to go to get to that point. Thank you very much. Um, next question. We've seen other schools have teachers boycott and not show up for work. How likely is that? And what plans are in place to address that situation if it happens? So I mentioned earlier that Teachers are part of all of our committees and um, as are other um, employees throughout the district. Uh, we are working together. There are some teachers who have some uh, health concerns and potentially will ask for leaves re regarding those. Uh, there are also other opportunities, COVID related opportunities for teachers to get some support. Um, and we'll, we'll continue working to provide PPE. Uh, for example, we had early elementary teachers wanting to get closer to the students and worried maybe if, if in teaching reading, if they were a little closer. Um, we have also uh, purchased face shields. We, we know that uh, so some teachers will be wearing both masks and face shields. Uh, so we'll, we'll continue to provide and, and work with uh, the teachers and whatever they need. Um, to feel as comfortable as possible. As, as we know, everything is a risk, right? We, we are all taking risks every day, but it's how, how do we balance the risk and follow all of the Department of Health, all of the state education department guidelines to minimize that risk as much as is under our control. Okay. Um, next, just as... I'm trying to get this through as many questions as we can here. The next one talks to ask about IEPs and special education. And I think uh, Joe basically already answered that one. Um, next question. If I understand correctly, a student or staff member who tests positive for COVID is not required to have a negative COVID test before they are eventually allowed to return to school. They just need to be symptom free for a specified amount of time. Also, people who are symptomatic are not required to get a COVID test. They also just need to be asymptomatic for a certain period of time. Am I understanding this correctly? If so, why is this the case? It does not seem a cautious enough practice. So, am I understanding the question? Nowhere in this question did someone test positive for COVID, correct? No one. There was one scenario oh, where they, oh. they, so, they initially tested, but then they don't have to have a so, negative test okay. to pass the gate to come back. So if we do have someone test positive for COVID, they must isolate for 10 days. Um, so that, that they may not return. We cannot make them. Um, get a test to return, but they cannot return and we will follow the Department of Health guidelines for positive tests. I assume basically all of these, the answer is that we are following the Department of Health mm -hmm. guidelines for what people need to do and the length of time that they need to quarantine. Correct. Right. Um, 
I, uh -huh. I might be able to uh, clarify that point. Uh, 10 days uh, is actually because uh, there is no detectable virus after 10 days in in our uh, excretions after a positive test. So that's why there is a 10 day moratorium. For quarantine, it is 14 days because that's about incubation period. So that, that confuses a lot of people. Why is it 14 versus 10? If I have positive virus, it takes 10 days for my system to clear the virus uh, versus if I get exposed to the virus, it might take 14 days for the virus to infect me. So for quarantine, we delay things for 14 days if I get exposed. But if I develop illness, uh, then it is 10 days. After 10 days in CDC tests, majority of people have no virus detectable in their excretions. Thank you. Next question, I believe we've asked, it's about, you know, when will we send out the cohorts? Um, next question, how will it work with drop off and pick up if parents need to drop off children at both schools at the same time? So we are um, working to try to coordinate that and we have a, a longer time frame that will be, um, be allowing the, the drop off um, I, I don't know if um, any of the principals would want to speak to the specificity of that. I, I think it will continue to be difficult dropping off at, at schools at the same time, just like it is uh, typically, but, but we'll try to um, provide. Uh, Jen, Jennifer? Um, well, I think during the midday switch, we're not going to have as much of an issue because there's a 90 minute period at the elementary school. So there's sort of a broader window for picking up kids and dropping off kids A versus B. I think the issue is probably more about the, the first thing in the morning and the last session at the end of the day. We've always been the same time, the drop off time and the pick up time have always been the same. Um, we've always recommended that people try to drop off elementary um, uh, after they drop off high school, just because the high school kids are able to be somewhat more independent. So um, we, we can stagger somewhat, um, but we do have to have staff in place in order to welcome the students. So it can't be a dramatic stagger, but it's probably still a good strategy um, to try to aim for the older kids first who you can do a little bit earlier. They have a little more independence to get to class and then to aim for the elementary school kids to come closer to the, the time that we're thinking, which is around 820 at the elementary schools. Thank you. Um, this next one, I think we've pretty much answered, plus there's an email address so I can follow up on that later if need be. Uh, next one says, do we anticipate that the entire 2021 year will be spent in a hybrid model? What will it take to get all students back on campus, a vaccine and or effective therapeutic? Um, so at at this point, we do expect a hybrid as, as long as we have to maintain six feet physical distancing, um, we will be in hybrid because we cannot fit all of the students on, on campus. So uh, that would again have to do with the Department of Health recommendations and, and right and the state of state education department guidance. So what, when that changes, we would be able to change how many students we allow on campus. Thank you. Uh, next one, can students in third grade receive a Chromebook considering older siblings at home, working parents are also using laptops, Chromebooks? So as uh, Paul Garifano already mentioned, getting Chromebooks is a problem. Uh, for, for even for the students who are supposed to have them in terms of our one-to-one our -one plan. So at this point, no, um, they are not able to, but certainly when Chromebooks are available again, we can look to those students um, who need loaners. We did have loaners um, in the spring as well. Um. Will the school recruit a dedicated teacher for full remote K-6 students like Scarsdale? Only 30 live minutes live interaction per day for full remote students does not seem to provide enough engagement. So um, our students will have more than 30 minute live interaction um, 
for our, our, our full remote students. Um, in terms of will we have a, a teacher only teaching remote students, that really depends on, on the numbers, depends on how many students at what grade level um, would be fully remote. Also, we have to be prepared as a number of parents have asked, are, would they be able to change their minds, right? If they were fully remote or if they were in person. So we also have to keep that in mind as we make the cohorts. Um, give me just a second. Um, okay, so next one is, um, are there any high school teachers that are already, that are going to be teaching remote only? Not at this time, because we don't have all of the numbers yet regarding the remote only students. Okay. Um, next one I think is based on something that is no longer the case. It talks about the transition time being only 42 minutes and is that enough time for the transition? Um, so, uh, right, so we are beyond that. Next one is really, I'm gonna skip, is really just a comment. It's just mentioning a number of the colleges that are not having students learn in person, but there's not really a question to go with it. Um, uh, we've already said that students are not gonna be required to get a test, COVID test prior to school. Will the school check temperatures of the students daily? Yeah, are you able to hear me on that one? Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Alex. <laughs> will, will the school check temperatures of the students daily? Um, we will ask uh, parents and students to check temperatures at home before the students come to school. And, and we will be purchasing an app and um, we'll send out training videos on how to use the app, but the parents will be able to use their phones or their computer to input the information. Um, there's one here that I'm not quite sure says, as will any new apps for the junior high school be used? Not really sure what that. I don't um, know if that's referring to any learning platforms. Yeah. I'm not sure, I think we'll have to skip that one for now. Um, why is the school not taking temperature checks as students enter school buildings? It takes two seconds to take a temperature with a touchless thermometer. Because all adults and all uh, students are going to be asked to do that at home and we're counting on parents as our, as our partners in uh, filling out the health screenings as well. It's not just about temperature, it's also about other symptoms. Okay. Um, has the Department of Health given the district any idea on how long it may take for contact tracing to take place since you have said that the decision to keep a cohort and teacher home in the event of a positive case will rely on them? Is there possibly going to be a number of days for the Department of Health to make this determination would you consider keeping the cohort and teacher home until the Department of Health has made a final decision? So again, I, I, I will follow the, the Department of Health guidance on that. And um, we will only know of a positive case if, a, um, if someone self-reports or if we get notified by the Department of Health because of, um, through, through, through testing. So those are the only two ways we will know of a positive case. And I know that, um, I, again, from, from what I've seen with some, uh, some districts um, who did have a positive case with a, with a summer program, the contact tracing did happen quickly. I, I, I don't know how that will happen in the fall, but again, um, that's our process for, for the follow-up. Um, is the district buying tents? How will outdoor learning take place? So um, there are lots of outdoor spaces um, and uh, tents, uh, 
uh, pose a particular problem because they have to be ABA compliant. They have to follow all of the state education guidelines for a, a, a learning space. Um, I know that there have been some discussions of canopies. I'm, I'm not exactly sure um, where, where that has landed, but we have been in discussion um, about possible canopies, but um, we're also very fortunate to have the breezeways um, at the junior senior high school. We are up even for, for the summer for all of the 12 month employees, we've put some chairs, plastic chairs out there. So if someone wants a mask break, wants to get outside, um, now that the weather is getting a little bit better, um, we, we can do that during the day. But any uh, other comments on canopies? Eve? Um, I'm also very happy to report that the PTA, um, who's always been collaborative with us, is working with um, the building administration to figure out how we can get our students outside safely um, and comfortably. So we are looking to purchase different um, seating options for kids and teachers to be outside, um, more likely on hard surfaces than on the grass, because we know on the grass there's morning dew, there's mud, there's many other distractions. So I do wanna take this chance to thank the parents and thank the PTA who are working in collaboration with us to figure out ways that we can be outside. And we are, all, are also using resources like local camps to find out what worked well for them in organizing students outside um, to have us working well when we are either inside the classroom or outside learning. Thank you. Um, I think this is a question in terms of, is this going to be different under our current circumstances? The question is, will there be an option for high school students to change switch classes and subjects? Something obviously that they've been able to do in the past. Is that gonna be, I guess the question is, is that gonna be impacted by the current situation. Victoria, uh, can I take that? Yes, please. So we want everyone to know that in terms of trying to create these cohorts, it's complicated because we have almost 400 different classes that we need to look at. Once we divide students up, we need to see if the division is equitable across in the two cohorts for a and PM school. We, we need to make sure they're balanced so that if we have a class of 25, if they are split, say 16 um, and nine, we need to make sure that those that, that group of 16, some of those move to the other cohort. So when we do that, we then need to make sure that any changes that happen afterwards that we don't throw off that balance so students can be five to six feet apart in classrooms. So that will limit our ability to have changes made to schedules. Uh, this, the schedule that's built, the master schedule doesn't have a lot of flex room so there will be few opportunities for students to change um, and counselors aren't in right now. So those requests couldn't be processed even if they were made, but th there will be limitations uh, more so this year than any other year. Um, next question I believe is based on a um, misconception. It talks about, um, says, I noticed there might be transportation available for Edgemont students in coordination with the Ardsley School District. Are they coordinating the plans of other school districts and transportation for available from both cohorts? I, I think you can comment if I'm mistaken, but th that transportation is for combination of um, special needs students who are sent to other schools because we don't have a program and parents who have chosen to place their students in other schools. So since we do not have general busing, it really doesn't apply. The fact that we um, went together with Ardsley was really for cost savings by sort of by having more purchasing power by having another number of districts uh, band together, but it really doesn't affect the average student. Is that a fair answer? Yes, it is, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so the person who had asked about this, Scarsdale Inquirer, has, has gone back and um, sort of elaborated on what their um, questions were. So, uh, and so they're basically saying there are certain parts of the New York State guidelines that the Scarsdale teachers have said will, I guess, effectively negatively impact their ability to teach. So the first one is 
They believe their ability to do their job will be limited or extremely limited under the current model with everyone being masked and six feet away from each other. So I don't. So th that is true. Um, students will be masked and um, I, I, it won't be normal um, instruction. Certainly it won't be pre-COVID instruction, but I, I, I do believe with the conversations we've had with teachers that they're going to make the best of it. And, and how do we build that community of kids? How, how, how do we help students to feel included? How, how do we help them to um, be connected even though with, with masks? I, I, I think the fact that it's a combination of in-person and remote can help because you get to see the face-to-face the -face on screen without the mask, but yet you get to at least be physically in the same space for instruction with your teacher for part of the day as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna read all of these, but as, as I read these, they seem to be, the common theme seems to be about how state mandates will um, affect the efficacy of the teaching process. Um, so I, I think, you know, the, as you sort of said, the, the general answer is yes, things will be different, but the only way to not have these mandates take effect would be a fully remote school, which has its own, obviously, effects, which we have said fairly clearly that if we have the ability to safely have in-person schooling, we want to do that. But I'll just quickly go through them. State mandates forbid teachers from huddling students together in groups. Um, so I think you have talked some about mm -hmm. different ways to let teachers collaborate without having to physically be on. Right, and, uh, and for, teachers, for, for teachers who will wear a face shield so that they can get at least a, a, a little closer to a student for some instruction. Right, next one says state mandates force teachers to keep students in rows all facing the same direction. Right. I mean, I guess that is right. something we've tried to be moving away from the 1950s model of mm -hmm. doing that, but um, because that is driven by driven by safety concerns. I think it's just something that we have to. Um, but unlike the 1950s, we'll have about 10 students in a class as opposed to 35 or 40. Right, right. Um, state mandates forbid the sharing of materials. I think that's probably answers. We have fewer and fewer times going physical materials being shared anyway, right? With mm -hmm. most things being online. And, and what you just said might address this next part and forbid teachers from walking around the classroom while students work and forbid teachers from checking over their shoulder while they're writing a thesis statement. Um, right, so, so we also have some shared ways that we're going to do that, Sh shared Google Docs for, for some, of the, uh, some of the writing, but um, yes, it, it will be different, that is true. And the final is, I guess, more of a statement and it says different districts have made different decisions about how to address these problems, but we're all facing the same problem and the point of view of another district may bring us to consider aspects not considered before. Um, I know, Victoria, you can talk to that, but I know that yeah, there's no, constant I, I, contact with all the other districts. I was going here. to say that is really important for us. I am on uh, conference calls with the Scarsdale superintendent at least twice a week. Um, as well as all of the other superintendents in Westchester, Putnam, Rockland counties, um, as, as, and, and the principals all belong to principal groups, are, are, are on with their colleagues. I know the directors of special education, directors of technology. So every, directors of curriculum and instruction, every single one of us are on groups and, and meets with our colleagues in other districts and are learning from and with them. So we absolutely appreciate learning from each other. How will art classes look like in the high school for fully remote students? Um, so I will ask, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking maybe uh, if uh, Paul, Paul or Mike could speak to some of the full remote 
I'm thinking animation for one, but other examples of some wonderful things that have happened in art fully remote. Victoria, I'll, I'll jump um, in. I think that uh, technology, one of the strengths of technology is the ability to capture art um, through photographs. And certainly a lot of the media that our kids are working in already in our art program are um, technology based. So you mentioned animation. Uh, we have a great photography program that is um, based on, uh, largely based, but not entirely on digital photography. Um, so there's possibilities there. Certainly um, our design and advertising course, a lot of that involves uh, manipulation of graphic images. Um, and so I think that uh, we're going to do our best. Materials are a problem. Um, if we're going to have kids doing things with drawing or clay, sculpture, difficult when they're learning remotely, but at least we can leverage the um, the technology to capture their performance and then to uh, to use that to be able to share it, have the teacher assess it and uh, and offer feedback. So I guess that's one direction that we could take our classes in. Victoria, I'll just add that if you were to go back and um, reflect on the time in the spring, although in light of the challenges that Mike spoke of there, I think our fine arts department at the junior senior high school did an incredible job of activating students um, at home with their own resources and, and really finding creative ways to extend what they do in the classroom uh, to a home environment and, and finding art and everything around them. Um, I think they put together some fantastic resources and, and collaborated on an awesome website of student work, which really just showed the creativity um, of the department and, and the students. And I would expect the same this year. Thank you. Um, what is the name of the app being used to survey the health of both faculty and students? Will faculty, faculty and students use the app daily or weekly or other? Um, the name of the app is Easy Screen, S-C-R-N. Brian, did that stand for anything or that was just a, an acronym? No, I think that's their acronym. That just um, and yes, it will, will be used daily. Uh, temperature taking um, for everyone daily and uh, the health screening questions um, are required daily for um, for all adults and uh, the, 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 the last guidance from the state and Department of Health was that it be um, the health screening questions be asked regularly for students so as we um, get the app up and running and get trained on it, we'll, we'll know more specificity about that. All right, next one says, how aware does the Board of Education think students and parents are that even in-school instruction will be significantly constrained by health and safety precautions and instruction will look far different from what it did pre-COVID? For example, Students will be in their seats and on computers most of the time. Significant movement around the classroom will disrupt social distancing, and we have been instructed to plan for one day, one class, one lesson plan, regardless of the setting, and using online resources is the only way to align tasks for in-school and at-home instruction, thus tethering students in all locations to their devices far more than in the past. Students' use of whiteboards will be limited or eliminated so that there is no sharing of markers. Students and teachers will be masked throughout the day, and the ability to learn and communicate through visual expressions will be severely limited. The ability of students to work together will be limited by physical distancing in the classroom, and having students in class converse with their peers online will likely create too much background noise for effective communication to happen. So, um, first part in terms of how aware do we think the parents and students are that will be significantly different and constrained. Um, I think that's why we're doing all of these forums right now is to help educate the parents on what it's going to look like. Um, we've begun that process. We've had a lot. We've also had discussions about having additional um, sessions or putting up resources mm. around, you know, sort of what, to, you know, take some different typical student scenarios and what does a day in the life of a student 
what's it going to look like under this scenario so that um, parents and students can have a better idea of wrapping their head around what it's going to mean. Is it going to be different as we've just talked about on some of the prior questions? Absolutely. And is it going to be, you know, in the end, probably less than what we would like to have for an Edgemont education? Most likely. I mean, we've said that, you know, we would prefer to have all students in class all day. Um, that's not possible under the situation. Again, all, to have all of, to eliminate any of those restrictions means remote only. And again, we think that is far more detrimental than maybe having hampering some of the in-person experience because of the, um, the safety precautions. I, I don't know, Victoria, if you or anyone else want to um, weigh in on that. Alec, I, can, I just want to say, you know, sometimes restrictions help us to become innovative. Right. And, and I think that that's, you know, we have to keep that in mind, that we know that this is going to be different. But I keep thinking every time I think different, I think new. So, you know, and new doesn't need to be bad. I think that we have to look at this. We, we have done some pretty miraculous things in terms of some of the training that our teachers have been undergoing in uh, the last few weeks uh, to make this a better uh, circumstance. And it's going to be new. And I'm really hoping it's gonna be innovative. Um, I, I don't think anybody wants to see quali the quality of the education suffer. I think that people are gonna work very hard to try to really make uh, the best of this and to really derive the best learning uh, from our students. Right. Um, yes, I would agree. I mean, I know that um, just the quality of, again, being forced to have these kinds of meetings, if you will, just the, I, 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 I know the amount of communication and collaboration and the quality of that for me has gone up tremendously because when you're constrained by having to be physically in the same room or just over the phone, uh, it, it typically happens much less frequently. frequently <clears throat> I think the, the quality has gone down. The ability to have you know, an ad hoc meeting on short notice when everybody just has to pop on their computer instead of, all right, how can we all physically get together. So I would agree with you completely, Joe. So some of the things that will come out of this will, will be positives. Um, certainly there will be drawbacks as well during this, but right, not everything that becomes different will necessarily mean uh, of, of less quality. Um, so I think that is important, but I, I think also the, you know, potentially part of what this question is there is that we, right, we do need to educate people in the community that this is not going to look the same as what they're used to, even though we, you know, even if we have these kids in school for, in person for half the day, that half day is not going to look like, you know, the first half of their day when pre-COVID, it will definitely look differently, so. But our, jo our jobs have looked different uh, right. uh, since this. And I think that, you know, that's another thing that perhaps parents can relate to, that things have changed for everybody. And so it's the adaptation that we make to this experience. And it's an opportunity to teach our kids how to adapt to something different too. So, I I'm, you know, I'm not trying to, to be Pollyanna-ish about this. But I, I, and I, and I share the concerns uh, that parents have. I'm a parent, so I, I share those concerns. But um, I also think that, you know, people are, are really kind of resilient and they can be innovative. And I think we're gonna come away with some interesting learnings from this. And, and we are gonna be tweaking things as we go along. We're gonna be looking at it and, seeing what's working. And I think there will be a lot of collaboration on what is working uh, best for our, our, our students. Uh, and I think we're gonna, we've done some good stuff with, with getting student voices involved too. And I think that that will continue right along. So we'll, we'll, 
we'll get a handle on it. We have to, we have no choice. Uh, these are our kids and we're going to do the best that we possibly can. Yeah, Joe, I, I agree with you. We don't have a choice. Um, you know, we didn't create COVID and would love to see it go away, but our, our goal is to um, make the best of it in terms of continuing to provide a quality edge on education in as safe a manner as we can. And that's a very difficult tightrope to walk. But, um, you know, uh, early on in this process, I wrote a, um, uh, an, an editorial for Education Week, which unfortunately was not accepted and they will regret that someday. Um, but um, it, it was really about how no matter how you slice it, um, this is going to be one of the seminal learning events in these kids' lives. They may not be learning the lessons that necessarily we want them to learn. They may not just be learning about math and ELA, but, but it's really our moral obligation to try to show them how, um, how adults deal with, with problems um, and not just hiding our head in the sand and wishing it would go away, but rather engaging it and trying to make the most of it. So, um, you know, I, I, I can understand how someone would become so, you know, kind of focused on the negative. Um, it's really hard. Um, it's been hard on all of us. But, um, you know, I, I, I think that we really have to continually model for kids the whole, you know, we're going to make the best of this. This is all we've got. And this is school for lack of a better, um, you know, way to put it. Uh, this is school. This is what we've got. We've got wires. We've got part time in person. And it's really on us to just kind of help kids make sense of that instead of um, just kind of trying to treat it like, you know, it's not there or whatever. So um, those are my sort of thoughts on the issue. I think that that question is um, an interesting one. It really forces us to kind of look in the mirror and say, what, what are we doing with this? Well, from a social and emotional learning perspective, this is an opportunity. You know, I, I think that this is where, you know, adult modeling becomes incredibly important. Um, I think that pulling together and collaboration, even though it's going to look different than we usually have it with groups in classrooms, um, we're going to find other ways to collaborate. And, I, and maybe the collaboration is really going to be about, you know, how we make things better for for all of us that are learning in this new and challenging environment. And that's a huge lesson, I think, for, for students, um, because that's what the world is, is really going to be all about, is collaboration. So um, from an SEL perspective, um, I, I see it as an opportunity. Great. Thank you all. Um, we only got a Alex? few. Yeah, please. Alex, this is Monica. I just want to yep. say, bravo. This is the kind of resilience, grit, and positivity we want to model for our students. So thank you for uh, bringing that to light. Um, we're getting down to the last few. As of today, what percentage has selected remote? Will you release data after the deadline? If a large percentage chooses remote, why can't kids who elect in person stay longer? So um, we, we will release the data in the, according to the survey monkey survey, we expected at least 25% to choose remote. Um, and we expected some uh, parents to, once they learned more about it, to possibly choose remote. So we, even more than that. Uh, but once we have the final numbers, we, we will release them. Um, in terms of why can't more kids stay in person um, longer, again, as I said earlier, that would depend on the numbers. It would depend on can we safely have, how many students can we have in the schools and safely social distance. And again, since parents at any time could change from remote to in person, depending on individual situations, um, we, we have to be aware of, of that too. Okay, um, next question says, I believe I heard that if a child's parent travels to a quarantine mandatory state, but not the child, the child is not required to quarantine with the family and may come to school. Isn't the child and parent considered to be one household unit? And does the child need to quarantine if anyone else in the household is positive? Um, I think I can take the first part of that mm -hmm. 
question because I'm living it right now. <laughs> um, I have twice in the last month had to go to states that were on New York's quarantine list. And the rule is that I have to quarantine from the rest of my family. So I've been, I'm, I'm currently coming, for anyone who pays any attention to backgrounds, I'm coming to you from a different background than the past because I'm uh, quarantining in my basement. So again, can we enforce these things? No, we can't enforce any of the rules that people are supposed to do outside of the school, but the, the, the reason for the rule not requiring the child in that case is because the parent is supposed to be quarantining away from the child. Um, the second half of the question, um, which I'm not sure if I can answer, um, does the child need to quarantine if anyone else in the household is positive? Yes, so if the child is considered a contact of a known positive case, then the child would have to quarantine. Right. Okay, uh, next question. What is the plan for maintaining uninterrupted instruction if when teachers get sick? In the AM, PM, AM, PM plan, teachers are exposed to both cohorts every day and are, and are statistically more likely to get sick than the students. According to what teachers have been told, the district is unable to meet the MERV 13 recommendation, which is necessary for removing COVID from the air and at the highest level, the EH buildings can use is MERV 11 and MERV 8 is the highest the elementary schools can handle. Also to clarify an answer that I heard earlier regarding the windows, in many classrooms only every other window opens and they only push out slightly so poor air circulation and ventilation is still a major concern for students and teachers. Uh, there's some more that but I'm going to stop with that part and um, Actually, maybe on the, well, maybe you can start with what's the plan for maintaining uninterrupted instruction if when teachers get sick. We'll start with that part. So, so if, if teachers are too sick to teach, uh, we would get a substitute. If teachers, for example, are required to quarantine for some, for a, a reason and are not too sick to teach, a teacher would, um, would be able to teach remote. But if a teacher is too sick to teach, a, a, a substitute would be uh, teaching. Um, for the next parts of these, um, I might ask if I could get um, Dr. Javid, if he's still on and available to touch these. So address the, the concept of that um, the teachers are sort of more apt to get sick because we have students coming in both the AM and the PM. Um, is that something that is, is of concern? Um, from, or have we lost Dr. Jibby? No, oh, he's here. Okay. Great. I'm here, I was muted, sorry. So overall, um, I think um, we, I actually had the same discussion with uh, Victoria a little bit earlier as well and uh, there, I went through CDC and state and all other requirements. I've been actually looking at a lot of businesses and um, schools and other uh, other situations. So, I, but I also primarily work in the hospital as well. But uh, the reason um, I wanted to tell you that I looked at the CDC requirements as well as New York State health requirements. There is no requirement of having a MERV 13 filtration system uh, in place. And that in itself is, is not like go to end all uh, preventing infections in a public setting. A lot of buildings, a lot of other places that have uh, people who work, for example, the building I work in uh, doesn't have more 13 filters. And it's not a requirement in a lot of places except for very select few uh, areas. Uh, and, and I think uh, important element really is to consider the air filtration is in itself is not the only element. And it's only required uh, depending on what is being done. 
in that area. In, in essence, in classes, students will be sitting and having the lecture class done. Um, there won't be a lot of activity. There won't be a lot of uh, air movements uh, or anything that uh, is um, is causing errors, what we call as aerosolization of particles into uh, the air. And and when I say aerosolization of particles uh, of uh, uh, that I have, uh, if I have infection into the air. When I say that, I know WHO in one of the articles talked about aerosolization, but that's very small part. So thinking about this small part in a very small part of uh, activity in a very small part uh, after I, I, I am doing hand hygiene, I'm doing, uh, I'm wearing mask, I'm doing all other things. So the, the, per, the, the chance of infection becomes extremely low in a situation like this. Uh, where, what I'm trying to get to is that more important really is the air exchanges and ability to move air and clear air. And John probably can elaborate that more, but I think uh, the filtration itself, uh, MERV 13 again is not required. It's not required in a lot of places and we don't really see outbreaks even in places that, uh, that uh, don't have it and are, uh, are already have uh, people coming there. So uh, I, I think the air, the air circulation and certainly um, John, if, if you could um, respond to what, what was the question specifically about the air circulation that, oh, in, in many classrooms, only every other window opens, they only push out slightly. Um, I, I guess maybe if you could just speak to, this is a questions about uh, ventilation on the EHS campus. I know that John got knocked out, but I think he was back. Um, so I, I know what John said actually on, on a meet earlier today when, when asked about uh, ventilation in classrooms and ask, uh, asked about temperature in buildings. He did ask to be invited to specific um, classrooms. So what we can do is look into any specific classrooms, look at the look at the windows, make sure that the um, unit ventilators are, are free and, and are completely open. But um, it's, it's good to hear about that, that focus on the ventilation and we will certainly do that. Sorry, I can add just from the conversation um, earlier today, I think one of the comments was when the new window packages were put in, there are some state guidances regarding, um, you know, the, the amount that the windows do open. And um, obviously there's a difference between an egress window and, and then the regular windows, but that John and his staff would also um, are taking a look at the upper sashes and, and what they can do with, in terms of creating additional ventilation there. Great, thanks Brian. And I, I think this is, that's especially, important in that this this was a question from a teacher so right if there are specific concerns about a specific room then they should be talking to john so that they can you know address any questions that they have about their specific situation as opposed to a, a general situation um, um right alec if i could just add because we have been adding and and, and um based on feedback that we're getting, for example, I know that we're also looking to put um, exhaust fans in classroom windows. We can't b blow the air in, um, but but we were looking at uh, again if they were high enough or or who can control them. But um, we, we're looking at a, a couple of different um, situations depending on the classroom, as 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 Brian said, uh, on the upper sashes of the windows. Um. Next part talks a little bit, again, it, it kind of relates to the first thing when teachers are sick, but are saying if they're not feeling well, state guidance says they should stay home in case their symptoms might be related to COVID. You're saying abscesses might be higher than normal. But again, I think as you just said, right, the difference between that situation and normal and same thing with the students, where you might stay home because you don't want to take a risk of passing on whatever you might have to someone else, but whether you're otherwise feeling okay in that situation, the teacher could continue to teach 
and no sub would not be required. It would only be if they are physically not up to um, be up to teaching. Right, and that's certainly something we would discuss with the teacher. We, we would not want anyone to think they had to teach if right. they were sick. Right. right. Okay. Um, um, this next one, actually, I'm going to skip for now and do follow up. It, it, it's some specific questions, you know, that they weren't clear on um, the remote learning and this is someone that's trying to make you know a decision for their child but um, they've left their contact information so I, I will see that we follow up with them um, uh, next one says will you be encouraging students and families to receive the flu vaccination via literature sent home or other means it's very important that we protect the community from what we can and lessen the burden on the healthcare system during another COVID spike? So I do know that the nurses uh, feel very strongly about um, more than ever making sure parents um, are up, bringing their students up and that they're up on all of their vaccines. So I'm sure nurses will be sending out um, anything that gets forwarded to them from the Department of Health and encouraging um, everyone to be uh, fully vaccinated. Um, next question is, um, oh, sorry, I missed one. Uh, how and when are you going to evaluate your plan in terms of learning outcomes? How is the school going to revise the plan if there is any need based on that evaluation? I don't know, um, Mike, if you want to weigh in on that one in terms of uh, the academic task force work and discussion on assessments. Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have an academic task force that has been meeting since the spring that has helped to um, uh, make plans for um, the coming year and to evaluate what was done in the spring. Um, and that practice will continue. Um, I'm a great believer in gathering data. And so the, the you know, as, uh, as I presented at the last board meeting, um, we used a lot of the feedback that we got from teachers and parents when we collected data in the spring to inform the decisions we made about this plan for the fall. And that process will continue. It's a cycle, right? You, you implement something, you look at how it came out, and then you brainstorm an even better way to do it. And so we'll certainly continue to look at, at both sort of perceptual data, how are students feeling about what they're doing, how are teachers feeling about what's going on, parents, but also then looking at student performance data, both informally and more formally, and talking with teachers, you know, what are they seeing in the classroom? Um, how are students responding to the plan? And, and we'll continue to tweak. I mean, I, I think that we have a really good plan, but there's no such thing as a perfect plan, especially in these circumstances. So we're going to um, watch it closely. And um, I'm sure this isn't the last time we'll be coming to the board and talking to about what, you about what we're doing and uh, and why we're doing it and, and how we continue to plan to evolve it. Great. Thank you. Um, would that question says would schools be more specific i think this is basically saying can the administration be more specific regarding uh i think it's the wording should be what teacher training for e-learn what regarding teachers training for e-learning and what percentage had during the summer what type of training teachers had and what is the school districts plan for future so uh, I, I don't have, in fact, we're, we're collecting that data right now because a number of teachers are still engaged and will continue to be engaged in um, different trainings right up to the first day of school on September 14th. But what we are, um, why we are gathering the data is so that we can differentiate for teachers. We, we know that teachers are in many different places in terms of their learning. Um, and we want to make sure that we're supporting um, everyone at, at their level of um, need and interest, uh, depending on subject areas, departments. So um, we, we will have that data, but we do not have that right now. 
Um, this next one has definitely been addressed before. Um, I'm going to read. Uh, I've got a note here from one of the board members saying that we I think we have addressed this next one. Um, so the next one says, what happens if a student and teacher might have an issue, meaning not connecting or other? What will be done and who can we speak to specifically in junior, senior high school? Because it has happened before. I'm not sure if I understand that, but if someone else thinks they do and can address it, then please. Sure. So um, any time um, you have a question about what's happening, obviously uh, the students can uh, ask teachers for extra help. Um, the parent can contact the teacher. Um, parent is also, um, after contacting the teacher, well, welcome to contact the principal. But um, we like to think of it as the person closest to whatever the issue is you're raising is the best person to solve that. So always starting with the teacher, then of course, uh, the principal or as, as necessary, depending upon the issue, the counselor, school counselor as well. Okay, um, I think we're uh, almost, Done. Let me just. Uh... Oh, unless Alec, I'm sorry. It might that might have been a technology issue? If the question was about technology. Oh, issue connecting. Oh, that could also um, to, right that reach out be. to the technology department and and uh, Paul Garathano. Yep. Thank you. Yes, that that could very well be what that one meant. Um, says a clarifying question: If teachers are too sick to go to school, but well enough to teach with the in-class lesson, I think, I think it must mean, will the in-class lesson have the students still in class on a Google Meet platform? Uh, so again, that's, that's something that I, I would um, discuss with the teachers and um, what will, again, as I said, the, the, this is a, a, a new, time and a new process for all of us. But um, I, I know that we, either we will have a substitute or we'll have a way for um, st students to be instructed. All right, well, at that point, we have answered everything that's in the, um, in the form. So thank you all. I mean, there are going to be obviously um, Um, all right, I'm going to circle back on one. I think we've answered this before, but um, certain other board members think that we haven't. So I'm going to ask it again. It says, as we know, the children might have COVID without even knowing how safe it is. Is it to have the kids in hybrid? And I believe we discussed that when we talked about all of the precautions we're taking are operating under the assumption that absolutely members of the community do have COVID and that's why we're taking those precautions. But um, again, well, I, that, that's exactly right. That's why we're physical distancing. That's why we're wearing masks. That's why we're washing hands. That's why we're cleaning. Um, exactly right. Okay. All right. With that, because um, we, we, not that there's anything wrong with that, but we do have some other business to get to and we have answered all the questions that are in the form. So I'm gonna call an end to this portion of the board meeting again. Again, there are going to be subsequent board meetings. There are gonna be subsequent parent forums and other venues for um, answering questions that people may think of that they didn't think or, um, um, But I would encourage, as Dr. Newell said at the beginning, please take time to go through the FAQ because there's an awful lot of things that are answered in there. And we do continually add to that as, as we get questions from 
calls or you know e emails that are sent to us and things um, we we are constantly adding to that so we would ask that you please try to um, go through there and, and get um, some of your answers from that but certainly um, uh, um, we will um, Again, there'll be lots more opportunities to um, ask questions. So with that, um, I'm going to move on to the next uh, section of the... Um... Can I just add one thing, Alec? Yeah, please. Sorry. Um, so, there's just, so I just want to make sure that people are aware of all the resources that are out there. There's been a lot of um, conversations that have already happened where the administrators and the um, um, and parents had to, the opportunity to ask a lot of questions. And, you know, it would be really helpful if parents use those resources as a starting point for answering questions so that we can continue to move forward with, you know, more complicated questions as they come up. And they certainly are more complicated questions. But I think there's just a lot of resources out there. And just in the interest of managing our administrator's time it would be great for people to really kind of take advantage of those resources before um, before their next session, just so that when they come to that next session, they're they're prepared and armed to ask. Um, the, more diff the more complicated questions that we're gonna to get to as we get closer and closer to getting back to school. Um, and so kind of in line with that, I just wanna thank the administration for being really patient and really thorough about kind of providing information and continuing to answer questions for, for the public. Right. Thank you, Marquita, for bringing attention. So for just along that line on, on the reopening website, I mean, tonight we've called attention to the FAQ section, but if you look at the parent forum section, there are recordings of multiple parent forums where right, some of these topics have been discussed in detail and the, the full recording is there available for people to, to watch if they weren't able to you know, attend the live session. There's a whole session on on health and safety. Um, there was, um, you know, both a, a elementary school and EHS um, discussions around uh, the schedules and such. And um, so those are all posted on the website. So yes, please take advantage of those because while we certainly want everyone to be as informed as possible, which is why all these forums are being held. Um, we do want to also allow the administrators to do the work of actually implementing all these wonderful plans that we've come up with and making sure that we're ready to go um, on the first day of school. So uh, thank you for that. Um, anyone else on the board want to make any other uh, comments or questions before we move yeah. forward? Alec, yes, it's Judy. Um, I just want to point out one thing that sometimes um, it can be uh, challenging uh, to find something on the website, maybe because you're not quite sure where, where it's specifically located. And um, actually, this is a tidbit that Victoria taught me a while ago, is to use the uh, search bar and just put in a search term into that search bar for whatever you're looking for. And as a general rule, I have had great success with finding um, documents or information that way. Great, thanks Judy, good tip for people to know. Okay, thank you all. Um, uh, the next portion should move fairly quickly, but of course, for those of you who are just on, feel a little bit like the jewel of the heart thing. For those of you who are just here for that portion, we. Uh, we are finished. Um, next item on the agenda is the um, second reading of the and adoption of the policy on um, our changes on community use of school facilities. Um, sorry. Uh, so, who on the policy committee would like to take us through that? Um, actually, I spoke to the policy committee, and since this was one that Monica and I had handled previously, right. um, I said I would take it. Um, basically, this is just. Uh, adding in COVID-19 specific information for use of uh, the fields uh, during this time. There are some added extras that uh, must be followed and the policy sets out what those added requirements are for um, groups that want to use our fields now. 
Um, as this is the second reading, um, we, we now um, take a vote on um, adopting it. Uh, do I have a motion to um, a motion to adopt? Uh, we have uh, Jennifer and a second by uh, Judy. Um, all in favor, if you could use the, the yes or no button down there. Um, it is passed, thank you all. Um, we now um, move on to, uh, well, let's take the sec each section separately. Uh, can, let's treat G as a um, consent part of the agenda. Are there any questions by the board or any of the individual people that we want to um, take separately for any reason or any comments that anybody on the board would like to make about any of those before we uh, take the vote on them? We're talking about just G personnel right now. Okay, then um, do I have a motion? Oh, sorry, Victoria, if you'd like to Yes, no, I'd question. like to <laughs> ask uh, the board's approval of G personnel numbers one through 24. Okay, do I have a motion to approve? I have Pamela, second by Marikita. Um, all in favor? Again, if we could use the yes. Um, okay, that's approved. Thank you very much. Um, we now have, uh, let's take H next. Um, again, is there anyone that uh, has anything they want to take separately? Or um, I believe we had um, one recusal. Is that correct? That's for business. Okay. No, but I think, Monica, we had a, a for a different reason, a different board member. Business uh, also. Okay. Um, okay, do we have a, uh, uh, sorry, Victoria, if you could ask the I'd question. I'd like to um, <laughs> ask the board's approval of H students of the committee meeting recommendations for the, for the board. Okay, do I have a motion to approve? I see Pamela Marikita for a second, um, all in favor. So that is approved. Thank you all. Um, now move on to the, the final group. Um, I business. So again, back to do, are there any um, items that we want to take separately or any questions or comments on any of the individual items? I need to recuse myself from number four. All right, Monica, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, I'm recusing myself from number two. Okay. Um, then, uh, then actually, just so we can get the um, vote properly for um, purpose of the minutes, um, then can we take one, three, five, and six together? Then, and then we'll go back and do two and four. I'd like to ask the board's approval of I business number one, three, five, and six. Okay. I have a motion to approve. Judy, a second, Nalesh, all in favor. All right, so that, those are approved. Um, so we now have uh, number two, and um, we have. Uh, I believe that was a recusal by G Jennifer for that. That's correct. One, okay. So do I? If, like to ask the board's approval of business uh, number two. Uh, there's a motion by Marikita, second by Judy, all in favor. All right, all right. so that passes with um, one recusal by Jennifer. And then I believe that leaves, uh, was that? Number four, I yeah. asked the board's approval of I business number four. Um, we have a motion approved, Marikita, second Pamela, all in favor. Uh, we have an approval with a recusal by Monica. Um, so that takes care of, um, 
all of the business items we have right now. Um, thank you all. Uh, next up is the scheduled meetings. Currently, the next scheduled meeting on the calendar is um, not until September 15th. Um, I believe we're anticipating that we may need to add one on the, the 1st of September, but uh, should we do that, we will um, let the community know as, as soon as we make that decision, we'll both blast out the community and update the, the calendar. Um, so with that, I thank you all. Um, and I ask if we have a motion to adjourn. Judy, uh, seconded by Pamela, all in favor. Um, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Alec. Thank you Thank all. you, everybody. Alec, before Thank you go. You. Good night, just... everybody. Good night. Good Sorry. night. Are we going to set a time separately? Uh, we're, we're, we'll find another time. I don't okay, want fine. people stick around after. But